everyone. Our first case this morning is Feldman versus Villa Regina Association. May it please the court, my name is Robert Glazier. I represent the plaintiff. At the end of a two-week trial, the jury found first that the Defendant Condominium Association had failed to properly maintain the building. Mr. Glazier, would you like to reserve some time for rebuttal? Uh, three minutes for rebuttal, please. Um, and second, the jury found that under either of the two possible theories of damages, my client had been damaged in the amount of $1,453,000. Now, the trial judge granted a new trial on damages only on the basis that the jury could not rely upon the evidence, which it did rely upon, evidence which was admitted without objection. It was clear this evidence was going to be presented. It was discussed before trial. The defendant said, Judge, we, sh we should keep it out. The but judge there was a limitation on that evidence, was there not there? The evidence was about what the restoration cost was going to be. It was going to be part of your experts. Um, information that your expert had. And there was a motion in limine, was there not, to keep it out? There was a motion in limine, and the trial judge said, you object to that evidence, and I'll exclude it. And the defense lawyer said, yes, Your Honor, I will. And then when the expert starts testifying, and there are questions leading up to it, you, there was an, uh, an estimate by Southern Construction, correct, and you looked at it, yes. Um, what was the amount of it? No objection. The law is. It, it, was, it was introduced as evidence as a, a loss of value, and there was no claim for the restoration cost per se. Is that not correct? Well, it was introduced, it came in through the witness as supporting his estimation of diminution of value damages. It was evidence of the cost of restoration. It was hearsay. But in but, order to arrive at the diminution value, he was taking into consideration restoration costs because that is the diminution value is the only damage that, that was requested. So it was a limited purpose that that testimony was coming in for. The evidence, there was no attempt, the jury had no idea there was any limited purpose. The evidence came in without objection, without, uh, without an argument or a request that the jury be limited in how it could consider it. It came in. It came in without limitation, and the jury could consider but all, it without but, limitation. But, the, but a lot of other people were there besides the jury, to with the lawyers on both sides uh, and the judge. And everybody knew, all those people knew, and we're in the same position, not of the jury, but of, the, of those persons. And everyone knew, and everyone knows now, that the only claim that could be considered by anybody in the court system is a diminution in value. Well, and I, he, didn't have an, he didn't have a legitimate opinion on that subject. The, well, he had a legitimate opinion on diminution of value and evidence came well, in. What was, he, he did give an answer as to what his opinion was of diminution of value, correct? Right. What it, was it? It was 1.8 million or above. Okay. Um, the, the jury awarded less yes. than that, but but I, I want to the address. The jury awarded less than the dollar of what the restoration damages were. I, I want to address the question of what actually went to the jury, because the argument made in the reply brief and, and perhaps behind one of the questions is that the only issue that the jury resolved was diminution of value. That is that is not correct, respectfully. What happened was there were discussions during the charge conference of what theories would be submitted to the jury, and. The jury was told that there are two measures of damages and you shall determine both of them. You will have a fork in the road. And if you determine that the damages were permanent. But during that charge conference, defense counsel did argue, and it, everyone agreed at that charge conference, that the only, the only thing that was being sought was diminution value. But because of our decision in Biscay that talked about temporary and permanent and whether it was you know, temporary, you only got restoration, permanent, you got diminution, that the way that the jury instructions and the verdict form had to be phrased was you had to put in something about restoration. But that's not a, that's not a measure of damages that your client ever saw. No. What happened here, the, the jury instructions and verdict form could have been created in a way that, okay, temporary or permanent jury, you decide that. If temporary, defendant wins. It could have been created that way. 
But the verdict form that went to the jury, which was agreed to by the parties, was not that. It had first decide what is a permanent or temporary. If it's permanent, then you answer one question on damages. If you decide that it is temporary, then you decide two other separate questions on damages. Okay, you're, saying, you're saying that as a result of what, how the jury instructions or the special instructions were structured, that the entire theory of the case, whether you tried the case, had been altered by that factor. It's not, it goes the other way, it seems to me. It seems to me that you have to interpret the instructions and the uh, special verdict forms in terms of what everybody knew was being tried at the time. I, You're I, putting the cart before the horse, the, uh, the head before the tail, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think what matters is what was presented to the jury for decision. And the trial judge addressed this issue. But they um, could, if, if they decided, if they decided that this was the restoration cost, which is what it was, to, to the dollar what it was, then that was an unlawful verdict. Well, it was not unlawful. I mean, nobody went to jail as a result. But it, it's not a verdict which could be made the subject of a judgment which can stand, which is what the trial judge did. I, I, I want to, there are two points I want to say in response. First of all, the issue of what was submitted to the jury was addressed by the trial judge post-trial. She addressed the argument made here by the defendant, which is, oh no, that didn't go to the jury, it wasn't tried. What the judge said was, I'll just tell you for the record that you, defendant's counsel, I believe that you waived that issue because we talked about our verdict forms and our jury instructions ad nauseum. And so forget that argument, because as soon as you let this go back to the jury and let them make the decision as to whether there was permanent value, permanent damages or fixable damages, as soon as that went to them, you waive that but issue. What, counsel, what are you reading from? What argument are you reading from? Here? This is in post-trial motions. Right, March. but, but it, if you read what happened when the jury instructions were being formulated and when the verdict form was actually being formulated, there was no waiver in that. There was, defense counsel was arguing all along in that, I know because I have the transcripts right here with me, highlighted and underlined, saying there was no there is no issue in this case about restoration costs, and the only reason that was put there was because in order to arrive at diminution under the Biscay case, a part of that calculation had to be, would the cost, temporary, permanent, would the cost of restoration exceed the cost is, of, of permanent? So question of economic waste. If it costs more to replace it, then uh, the value it's wasteful to do that. Th that is that's, that's the only thing that this is talking about. <laughs> and that was the discussion during the charge conference. It, and and you, there's no way, perhaps that was the judge's recollection afterward, but during the charge conference, the defense counsel was right in there repeatedly saying, there's no restoration, and there's no restoration evidence. There's no proof of restoration. That, what the jury instruction said was you have to decide on the measure of damages. What the verdict <coughs> form said was you have to determine both measures of damages. Not, and let me say, if you, you decide it's You say it's a measure of damages and we say, and I think we probably have a superior uh, right to say something about this subject, we say it's not a measure of damages, it's a, uh, it's a addition and it's a guideline in case the case comes out in a particular way. It well, is not a measure of damage. It was said over and over and over and over again, <coughs> we are not seeking restoration damages. That is not the issue. Well, the, the verdict form laid out two paths. You, you, to, you, Mr. Can, we, can, we skip and, over the, can we skip the verdict for a minute? Because I have a question to yeah. ask you that goes back to the evidentiary issue. You concede that at the trial, you specifically said you were not seeking damages under a restoration theory. Am I right? We said we were seeking diminution of costs. Yes. No, I know you said you were seeking diminution, but you specifically conceded you were not seeking restoration damages, correct? We said that at the beginning of the trial. So then what basis, upon what basis would they object to the expert's testimony about the restoration value when they knew that the only purpose that could be served by that evidence was data relied upon by an expert, consistent with that kind of data relied upon generally by an expert, 
in arriving at the minutian value. There would be no reason for them to object to the evidence coming in when the only possible relevance for that evidence was the expert's consideration of that data in arriving at a diminution value. Why would they need to object if you weren't seeking restoration damages? The point is that they did object the first right before trial. They said, yes. Judge, don't let this in. Right. And, and the judge said, I'm letting it in. Uh, no, no. The judge said, you object at the time. And I'll exclude it. But and not, and the defendant's lawyer matter. said, I will do that. That's, but, not but, an, that's not an answer to the question. But it doesn't matter. They, if the only possible relevance that that evidence could have is its, its, its impact on diminution value, they probably said, we don't need to object. It's not, they're not seeking restoration, so it can't come in to prove restoration because they can't get a verdict on restoration we, damages. We may, excuse me, we, we may sitting up. Uh, as uh, a part of that, there, can, there is no such thing as restoration value. It's restoration expenses. The okay. two are, are not in right. the same ballpark. What we, the evidence that came in, I mean, the, obviously the fact finder is the jury. Nobody told the jury what it could consider this evidence for. The it came in and they could. Nobody told the jury that the defendant in a first degree murder case had been uh, convicted three times previously of the same thing. They don't have to know that. It's not relevant to what they are deciding but, or what the effect of their verdict is. But here. The whole, the, all of trial, 90% of trial, is keeping things from the jury. Are, are you but, suggesting that? By agreeing to the verdict form, there is something of an implied waiver by, I, I, by the other side? By the I am not simply, yes, I am suggesting that based on what the trial judge found. The trial judge found, I was reading before, well, you waived that issue, so forget that issue. I'm not worried about it. That's what the judge. A, a, a waiver is a conscious uh, relinquishment of a known right. There was nothing here because everybody knew what they were just, well. So, so your, argument, your argument must be that as a result of them agreeing to the way in which the verdict form is phrased, they, they impliedly consented or impliedly waived their right uh, not to have a restoration damages theory submitted to the jury. Even they, though they had explicitly is, said is, is that, is that Is that your argument? That is, they agreed to submit both theories of damages on alternative paths to the jury. There's one more point that I want to make. I mean, as Judge Schwartz mentioned a few moments ago, the reason why we have these alternative theories or sort of cautionary limitations is we want to make sure that it's not an unfair or economically absurd result. Here we have from the jury evaluations of damages under either theory. But you're in you're in much better shape than you than you would have been had the jury ruled for you on your uh, on the on the theory that you actually said. Because the 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 uh, amount of restoration damages can be now argued at the new trial. Well, then you you can get this now, but you can get it when you explicitly said, "I don't want it, and we're not trying it that way." What we have now, I mean, yes, yeah, yeah, so on a retrial we may get more money, but what we have now, I mean, there's something to be said to collecting a verdict that exists now. And what the jury found, considering both theories of damages, is the same amount. And, and there's the, um, uh, the case that says, the U.S. security case, where the amount under both theories is the same, the difference doesn't the, really the matter. The diminution of value, which is all that you asked for, is exactly the same amount to the penny. The diminution of value of this apartment to the penny is the amount that they spent to restore it. That, that's absolutely true. That, and therefore, it's there is. It's and that, absolutely true. It's also absolutely unbelievable. Well, the jury, if the jury had not issued, listed the restoration cost and just said 1.453 million in diminution of value, there's nothing in the world wrong with that verdict. But the fact that they put it both does not make except one. They found it temp except they found the damage was temporary. They found that the damage was temporary, but the, my point is that. And the only damage for temporary is restoration, and there's no evidence. There's no evid competent, substantial evidence of, of restoration costs. Well, there was clearly evidence that came in, and there was no attempt to tell the jury, you can't use that for restoration costs. Um, Counsel, we've let you go way over your time, but we'll still give you two minutes on rebuttal. Come on. Uh, 
May it please the court, I'm Warren Klovnik on behalf of Villa Regina Association. <clears throat> uh, with my time, uh, I'd like to start with a point on my cross appeal, if I could. Um, the main point on the cross appeal, which is uh, that the association- Will you speak up a little, counsel? I'm sorry. <laughs> which is that the association is entitled to a directed verdict and a judgment in its favor in this case. The plaintiff went to trial on two claims of damages, diminution in value and loss of rental income, and he lost the case on the two and only two well, theories that he- did trial counsel agree to put the restoration, that if you checked off temporary, that you would get restoration. That was a theory that wasn't pled, that wasn't tried. Everyone knew that. Yet, counsel for the defense agreed to have that on the verdict form and to have the jury instructed on that theory. I exactly. Uh, the, I'm sorry. Isn't oh. that true? It, it is true. Um, but a few things are also true. One is uh, they felt that they needed to comply with the case law that says the jury needs to be provided with this framework. Is it temporary? Is it permanent? Because that dictates what the proper kind of damages are. That wasn't inconsistent with the stipulation. That was in furtherance of the stipulation to figure out what the plaintiff was entitled to. Also, you know, the judge, I think, relied upon that as counsel read as a finding that there was some kind of waiver or abandonment of the stipulation. We'd moved for a directed verdict based in part on the stipulation. You shouldn't have to move for a directed verdict to enforce the stipulation, but we did. And what that demonstrates is we weren't abandoning it. We were actively enforcing it. This was a fallback position. I exactly. And second, as, as, uh, as Your Honor recited, during the charge conference, we made clear to the judge, judge, we're submitting these to the, to the jury because they're part of the puzzle. In other words, the Biscay case requires it. But judge, remember, they stipulated they are not seeking restoration costs. So you can't have an implied waiver when we're explicitly and repeatedly reaffirming the stipulation. Um, and, and I think Your Honor is right. I think this was the judge's recollection weeks or months after the trial. Um, but the record shows what it shows, and we were... What would the, the... Hang on just a second. Let me just ask you hypothetically. Let's assume the jury had made a finding of permanent damage. What would the value have been to the fact-finding that had been made on restoration damages? Walk me through that so I have an understanding okay. of what value that fact-finding <coughs> would have been in the verdict form. Had, the, had they made a permanency finding? Had they checked off permanency, they would not have answered the question for restoration. They would have just gone down to the line and put in a diminution in value number. Okay. Um, so, so then it would have no added value? It would that, have no, no, it would be a redundant finding. And in fact, as it was... Hang on just a sec. Okay. Stay with me now. So, <clears throat> but they, so, if they, so there must be value then to a verdict form where the jury checked off temporary. So walk me through that and tell me what the added value of that fact finding was on the verdict form. When they check off temporary, that should have foreclosed any recovery by the plaintiff in this case for restoration damages. Wait, the, didn't you just say the same thing on permanency? Well, um, except that they would have recovered in that scenario the element of damages did, that they were looking for. Did the verdict for. form say if you, tep if you check off <coughs> temporary, that's the end of the case? They could have that's done that. That's really what, what it should have been. It should have been. Well, I don't know if it should have been. It could have well, been. Well, it should have been on the, on the basis of, since they weren't seeking restoration, and they could, uh, since it was only a temporary, something happened temporarily to the apartment, <coughs> uh, they weren't entitled to anything. Well, let me answer that in a few ways. One, yes, the verdict form could have been phrased that way. But the question is, is including what turned out to be an unnecessary entry on the verdict form, does that waive the stipulation? And I would say absolutely not when we expressly told the judge at the charge conference, we're putting it to the judge so they have the complete, I think the, the concern well, was. If it had said that, however, we wouldn't be here. Right? Probably and not. We wouldn't have uh, Mr. Grader, I mean, he's not, I mean, he's a lot of things, but he's not frivolous. I mean, there was, there's something to be said for what he was saying that uh, I'm not going to quantify how much to be said, but uh, if, if it had said that, which would have been correct, since he's not seeking, you're not seeking restoration damages, and you only get restoration, and you don't get restoration, and you only get restoration damages when it's temporary, that's the end of it. It's temporary and you don't get it. Well, they certainly could have done that, but I think counsel, there's a few responses to that, Your Honor. One is, uh, the lawyers I felt, I think felt that they needed to provide the jury with the complete picture and that it would, might have been confusing to provide them with something that leads to a dead end. All, um, all they have to, nothing confusing about it. If you ask, <coughs> if you, if you uh, check temporary, your deliberations are an end, you sign your verdict and date it. Well, I think at the very worst, this could be called a redundant line in the verdict form, because we have two options otherwise. One is, we subject the association to one and a half million dollars in repair costs that everyone knew were not being sought, that we repeatedly affirm the stipulation, or we hold them to their stipulation and we chalk this up as really what it was, which is a redundant 
finding on a verdict form. You and mean by redundant, you're saying putting the same number in for both uh, diminution and restoration? Well, maybe redundant is not the right word, but an unnecessary entry telling you to even surplus Because you as had to have the restoration costs to determine whether the diminution value was going to be equal to or greater than or greater than. Well, that's true too. And but I, since, since since it's only temporary, the jury only found the temporary. You don't need the restoration costs. Given that they weren't looking for restoration <coughs> costs, it could have just said if you find temporary, end of story. But you know, again, I think we can at the very worst, this was an asking the jury to put an unnecessary number. Certainly, nothing that manifests a knowing intentional well, waiver the, of a stipulation. Well, your real issue is whether you can make a jury question for them out of nothing. It, right. There Where there was no, was no jury there question. Was, they asked, they only got what they specifically weighed. Exactly right. Exactly right. And, you know, I think when it shows repeatedly on the record that we were reaffirming the stipulation, even as we're talking about the verdict form, the worst you can say is this asked the jury to make a finding that wasn't necessary. Mm -hmm. Certainly does not result in a stipulation of, that we relied upon. And if you look back when they made the stipulation, you know, they deterred us from doing discovery on repair costs. We didn't present evidence on what we thought might be the repair costs. How fundamentally unfair now to say you, you owe one and a half million dollars on, a, on a, the only element of damage returned by the jury, which is an element that they by stipulation were never suing for. Um, I think that's fundamentally unfair. And again, the only two elements of damage they put to the jury, they lost. I think we're entitled uh, to have a judgment in our favor in this case. Actually, you're, you're in your argument really is that you're entitled to a directed verdict, but that you're entitled to a judgment on the jury verdict. I exactly right. We pitched it to the judge as a, really an unnecessary motion for directed verdict on the restoration costs, um, but you're right. As to everything that the, they were looking for from the jury, we're entitled to a judgment on the verdict itself. And that's what we're asking the court to do, first and foremost. Did you, did you file that motion, precisely? It was, it was included in our, we, we, called the motion a motion for judgment notwithstanding the verdict because we were dealing with the uh, finding on restoration costs. But it argues in that motion that the jury award only entitles them to restoration, they stipulated they weren't seeking it, and we're entitled That's to That's the it. end of the case. That's and the end of the case. And you also argued there was no evidence, I think. Yeah, he argued support. that in addition, which really follows uh, from the very finding by the trial court when it granted the new trial on damages. And uh, if I could, I'll turn briefly to that. Uh, and so again, first and foremost, we're asking for a remand for a judgment in our favor. Um, alternatively, um, we would ask that the court affirm the new trial on damages for, for, and it sounds like the court understands our position on that. Everyone understood why the expert was testifying the way he was. The, the, the absence of an objection, I think, really misses the point. The judge didn't say, I'm granting a new trial because inadmissible evidence came in. She granted the new trial because the jury relied upon a number for something that everyone knew it was not being presented for. And that's undeniably true. They had no claim for restoration damages. And that's they not a basis for a new trial. It's a basis for a judgment, one way or the other. Exactly right, which is really the second alternative argument. To leave aside their stipulation, the judge's own correct finding that there is no competent evidence of restoration cost is a second and independent reason why we get a judgment in this case. Um, I don't know if I have any time left. No, your time is about up, counsel. All right. So uh, I think I've indicated the relief we're requesting, and, and I ask the court to <coughs> provide that. Thank you. Thank you. Council will give you two more minutes. The, throughout, it was clear, as the trial judge said, that the restoration damages were actually in play. They were submitted to the jury. Perhaps the reason why that the defendant agreed to let it go to the jury is if there had been simply a finding of um, uh, the verdict form that said, if you find temporary, end of story, go home, well, then they would have moved down the other path. But they put both there, both issues, both measures of damages were in play throughout the trial. If they had truly wanted this evidence out and not included, they would have objected as they did the first day before trial, at least said, no, it shouldn't be used for that purpose. The evidence came in, it could be used for any purpose, and here, the suggestion that there should be a directed verdict when you have a finding of liability on two different theories and a findings by the jury on both measures of damages in our favor. There's no basis for a directed verdict, and the new trial should be reversed as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both.